Chapter Twenty Four of A Mayfair Magician, A Romance of Criminal Science. Recording by Aaron White. A Mayfair Magician, A Romance of Criminal Science by George Griffith. Chapter Twenty Four. As was only natural, Headley Seaman's thoughts for the rest of the day were pretty equally divided between what had happened at the garden party and what might happen that night at the Institute. The more he dwelt upon the suspicion that Harold had managed to connect his former self with his present one, the more uncomfortable he became, and with him to feel uncomfortable about any one was the same thing as deciding to put the unpleasant personality out of his way by whatever means seemed easiest and most efficacious. This incident, too, was not without its effect upon the desperate, if unrighteous, passion he had conceived for Grace. He knew that the mere fact that nursing such a passion placed him, as it were, in the position of a moral outlaw. This, of course, did not trouble him in the slightest. In fact, it had been his normal position almost ever since he had been able to distinguish right from wrong. But it is one of the curiosities of human nature that the worst of men are generally pleased to find some sort of an excuse for their wrongdoing. Grace, it was quite clear to him, was absolutely unapproachable. Her whole existence was entirely bound up in her husband and her baby son. The mere idea of anything like levity of conduct in connection with her seemed unthinkably absurd. Unless a woman is radically bad or incurably frivolous, she can only fall through powerful, nay, almost irresistible temptation. But what temptation could tempt Grace Enstone, throned as she was in her splendid position and protected by the triple bulwarks of love and duty and pride? His millions might have brought poorer and weaker women. Indeed, there were more women than one who held their heads high in society, who had stooped to be indebted to him for exorbitant milliners' bills and desperate losses at bridge which they dared not disclose to their husbands. But here again Grace was doubly sheltered by the golden rampart of her husband's ever-increasing millions. If his ends were to be obtained, they could only be by means in which neither mercy nor scruples had any part. Crime, certainly, and violence, if necessary, offered the only hope of success, and now that his passion and the animal instinct of self-preservation had begun to work together, there was no length to which he did not feel himself prepared, nay, as he could almost persuade himself that he was not entitled to go. If Harold Enstone could connect his past with his present, and prove that Headley Siemens, the European gold king, was identical with Collier Banfield, the western gambler and desperado, with a dozen murders and minor crimes to his credit, it would certainly mean social ruin and disgrace, and possibly financial catastrophe as well. If Sir Godfrey Enstone had left behind him any definite record of the discovery of Lone Hill Mines, which were the cornerstones of his fortune, it would be anything but convenient or pleasant to satisfy the claims of his heir-in-law. Finally, there was the even more unpleasant contingency of his being called to account for procuring the murder of Harold's own father at Yokohama, for he happened to know that his Eurasian accomplice had left a sworn and witnessed confession behind him. There was, therefore, as he said to himself while he was driving down to Dulwich, every possible reason to consider Harold Enstone as a most dangerous obstacle in the path of his almost royal progress, and that being so, it was not only necessary, but obligatory to get him removed as quietly, as swiftly, and with all as effectually as possible. The only question was, now that he had come to this decision, had Jenner Halkine really returned to life, and, if so, would he help him? and that was a question which he had determined to solve before he had left the Institute. He had to admit to himself that he entered Isa Ramal's private sanctum with feelings, if not exactly akin to fear, at least of somewhat anxious apprehension. "'Good evening, friend, brother, as I trust we may be able to greet you before you depart,' said Isa Ramal, as Ram Dass salaamed him into the room and vanished. "'Good evening, doctor.' replied his visitor as they shook hands. "'Friends, of course we are, at least I hope so. But, brothers, perhaps you will pardon me for asking your interpretation of the difference between friendship and brotherhood.' "'Why should you not?' 
replied the director in his gentlest tones. It is just that subject which I wish to discuss with you before you, if I may put it so, cross the threshold of our chamber of secrets. But I was under the impression, said Siemens, as he took the chair towards which Izar Ramal had waved his hand, that I had already crossed it, at least, that is, if you are referring to the scene of my too brief experiment with Princess Natif. It is the same, and yet not the same, replied Izar Ramal gravely. Still, that will serve as an introduction to what it is my duty to say to you. On that occasion you obtained a brief glimpse into the mental working of a beautiful and brilliant woman, who, in spite of the fact that she is possessed of fortitude far above the average of her sex, was nevertheless unable to sustain the ordeal of viewing the soul of Hedley Siemens unveiled. He paused, and looked into his eyes as though without the aid of the magical soul-searcher he would read the thoughts which were passing through his mind at the moment. His guest returned his gaze with perfect steadiness and said quietly, Yes, I quite see what you mean. And now? Now, continued Isa Ramal, still holding his eyes with that magnetic glance which Hedley Siemens had come to know so well, now it will be you whose fortitude will be tested. You will be brought, in the mental sense, face to face with one who is not the least of the adepts. You will see him eye to eye, and soul to soul, and if you sustain that ordeal, you will henceforth be one of us, whether with your will or against it. I'm afraid I don't quite follow you there, doctor, interrupted Hedley Siemens, who, in something like his usual masterful tone, with my will or against it. Really, I must ask you to make your meaning a little clearer. It is easily explained, said the other, without the slightest trace of feeling in his tone. The bond of our brotherhood consists in absolute knowledge, and therefore in absolute confidence. To put it otherwise, if two human beings know each other as they know themselves, they are obliged to trust each other, whether they will or not. Your own studies in mental science will, I trust, make that position perfectly plain to you. I think I follow you. In other words, you mean that a man who knows everything, hidden and unhidden, about another man must be trusted by him simply because, to put it quite vulgarly, if he didn't, the other fellow could always give him away, and— He went on, leaning forward in his chair with his elbows on his knees, and talking at Isa Ramal as if he had been an objecting shareholder at one of his own company's meetings. As it may be taken for granted that the veneer of civilization is not much thicker than a coat of mahogany stained on plain deal, in other words, that we are all savages under the skin, and therefore in the eyes of modern civilized persons, criminals. If we all understand each other thoroughly, and each of us knows enough to find means of putting his brother criminal, actual or potential, outside the pale of society. Am I right, doctor? Yes, replied Isa Ramal, also leaning forward with his elbows on his knees. You are so completely right in your entirely unconventional estimate of the situation that I feel I ought to compliment you upon your very close approach to our position. After what you have said, I feel obliged to say that I think there is little fear of your surviving the ordeal. Surviving, doctor? said the millionaire with a just perceptible start. I wasn't aware that this was a matter of life and death. Only of mental life or death, my dear sir, replied Isa Ramal, not physical death. That, you will admit, even if desirable under certain circumstances, might produce complication which we have no wish to be troubled with. And now, he went on, rising from his chair, if you feel quite prepared to commence the experiment, will you follow me? Only, he said again after a little pause, for the last time I must warn you that the threshold of the Chamber of Secrets must be for you the borderland between two roads, the world of the half-knowledge you have now, and that of the perfect knowledge, if you are found worthy to bear the burden. And the perfect knowledge, does that also mean the perfect power? The man who knows all things within the scope of human life, can he also do all things within the same limits? 
That, my dear sir, depends entirely upon the way in which the perfect knowledge is used. We, as I have hinted to you before, do not measure right and wrong, virtue or vice, but according to the conventional standards of a world which is almost entirely populated by human beings in a very low stage of moral and intellectual development. We do not judge ourselves or each other by, we will say, the standards of the law of England. Exactly, interrupted Headley Siemens, who had been waiting for his advantage. I quite see what you mean. In fact, it is hardly necessary to quote the case in point. There is no necessity, interrupted Isa Ramal, with a motion of his right hand towards the door. I think that we shall understand each other quite well enough without any further explanation. And now, he continued, stepping outside the door into the passage, there are two ways before you. That one to the right will, as you know, take you into our entrance hall, and from there back to the commonplace world you have lived in so far. This one, he went on, making a motion with his left hand towards the curtained corridor, which, as Headley Siemens knew, led to the Chamber of Secrets, will take you into another world, the world of perfect human knowledge, and therefore of influence and power, and, it may be, even as you use that power, to an invisible throne from which you may sway the destinies of nations, since knowledge is power. Then, of course, I take this one, said Headley Siemens, turning to the left, and laying his hand lightly on Isa Ramal's right shoulder. But there are other things dear to the heart of man which even those who sit on thrones do not always attain to prizes which all the political power of the world cannot compel, and all the money that was ever coined cannot buy. Can this knowledge and power that you have told me about compel these also? As they are used wisely or unwisely, yes or no? I can give you no clearer answer than that at present, replied Isa Ramal, taking his hand from his shoulder and holding it for a moment in his own. Then he went on, his voice almost sunk to a whisper. "'You have been blessed by the love of a woman for whom many other men have hungered. You are cursed by your own love for a woman who, so far as the conditions of the world in which you live are confined, is unattainable to you.' "'And under the other conditions?' "'It is not I who have undertaken the task of leading you across the border of your world to ours.' replied Isa Ramal in his strangely impersonal tone. "'I know that because you have told me so already,' said Headley Siemens, instinctively gripping his hand hard. "'What I want to know is just this. When I go into that room, shall I meet Jenner Halkine in the flesh? I mean the man who—' "'Yes, yes,' replied Isa Ramal, laying his hand on Siemens with a little stroking movement which instantly relaxed his grip— Yes, not only in the flesh, but also soul to soul. When you have done that, then, and if you remain yourself, it will be time for us three perhaps to talk over those other, smaller matters, which now seem to be of such importance to you. I can ask for nothing more than that, replied the Gold King, dropping his hand. I am entirely at your service and ready to learn all that the Chamber of Secrets can teach me. "'Very well, then,' said Isa Ramal, parting the curtains at the end of the corridor. "'This way lies knowledge. But do not blame me if afterwards you remember that the wisest of the wise said many centuries ago, "'Whoso getteth knowledge getteth sorrow.'" End of chapter 24